So today we are talking about how to train for high altitude hiking if you live at sea level. Hey, my name is Rowan Smith and I want to welcome you to the Training for Trekking podcast. Now this is the world's very first podcast which is entirely dedicated to helping you train, prepare and conquer your upcoming hike, trek or mountain adventure. So once a week, I'm going to be giving you quality and practical information on the subjects of physical preparation for trekking, dealing with attitude and nutrition on the trail, so you can know everything you need to be doing to have the best chance of a safe, enjoyable and successful adventure. So now you know what you're in for, let's get into today's episode. High altitude hiking is something that many, many people aspire to, where they've had dreams of their life of going up to Everest Base Camp, or they've always aspired to hit Kilimanjaro, or you know any of these big mountains. They really do hold a big appeal to a lot of people, and a lot of people have been dreaming about it, had their own, on their own bucket list for years and years and years. But one of the most common questions I hear from people is, how do I prepare for this when I don't have any mountains around me? Because nine times out of ten, when people ask this, People will pipe up and say, hey, the best way to get ready for attitude is you've got to spend time at attitude. And that makes complete sense and it's 100% true. And that might be practical for people who live near mountains who can, you know, go on a holiday or go on a training hike up to a reasonable moderate attitude or something like that. But for the other half of us who don't happen to live near any mountains or any available attitude, what can you actually be doing? So today I'm going to be um, talking you through what's worked, what I usually recommend, what's worked for my clients in the past, and hopefully give you a really clear plan of attack and some really clear information on how you can best prepare your body for the demands of a high attitude hike when you actually live at sea level. Now, to start with, I want to say the reason why I'm talking about this and the reason why I know there are practical things to talk about is basically I live in Sydney, which is just about one of the flattest places on earth. Um, In Australia itself, the highest mountain we have is about 2,000 meters or something. So we have absolutely no attitude to speak of. But saying that, there's so many people who aspire to these treks like Everest Base Camp, Kilimanjaro, Elbrus, Aconagua, all of these things. And people regularly come to me because this is my job from day to day and they're preparing for these adventures, but they don't have any mountains. So Over the last few years, as I've been training these guys, you know, I really, really have noticed there are some particular things you can do to help their preparation and get them over the line and make them feel a little bit more comfortable. The reasons why I know this works is quite often they'll come back to me on the treks and more often than not, they'll say they'll feel a little bit more comfortable than people. Their acclimatization was a little bit quicker than other people and they were feeling happier to walk closer towards the front of the pack as compared to the other people in their group. Obviously, that's not incredibly scientific. It's very anecdotal, but so far it seems to work. So I'm pretty confident in what I'm going to be saying. Now, before I go any further, I know there's going to be something that's running through a few people's heads, which often gets thrown at me when I talk about these things. And people love to pipe up and say the words that there is no correlation between physical fitness and attitude sickness. And this is a statement you'll see everywhere in on the internet. Now, the reasoning behind this is basically there's been a few studies or a reasonable number of studies which have, which have taken um, compared the differences between um, people who aren't really very much fit and people who are pro- quite highly fit and taken them up to attitude and seen what the rates of attitude sickness are. And it turns out, and it turns out according to the studies that there isn't really a major difference in between the rates between people who are super physically fit and people who are just moderately fit. There's been nothing really shown to be the difference. And that's led those studies to conclude there's no real correlation between physical fitness and attitude sickness. And while yes, that is true, there is one point which people miss when they go over this thing. And the fact is that physical exhaustion is a risk factor when it comes to attitude sickness. So while you you are reasonably fit it might not protect you more than being outrageously fit if you're not fit enough while you're on the trek and you are getting fatigued and exhausted it is going to put you at a higher risk of attitude sickness so so many um so much of the time people miss this really really crucial point and so what we're going to be talking about today is just about how you can make sure you don't reach that point of exhaustion make sure you're as comfortable as you can in this environment and then hopefully as you go through and you take your time acclimatizing up the mountain and you go through all those other essentials which you should be doing while you're on the mountain you're going to give yourself the best chance possible of having a safe acclimatization and actually getting to your end point 
So now that's out of the way, let's talk about specifics and what can you be doing physically to prepare your body for a high altitude hike when you don't have access to high altitude. So number one is aerobic capacity development. Now aerobic capacity is purely your aerobic fitness and it's your ability of your body to produce energy while using oxygen as a fuel source. Now this is the single most important aspect of your fitness you need to develop before a high attitude hike which will in help you with your success. Now I cannot stress this enough how crucial this is. Now the way you develop this is through long duration lower to moderate intensity exercise. So this might be things from your regular hiking which hopefully you're doing, it might be cycling, it might be running, it might be longer walking, it might be doing stuff on gym cardio machines, it might be swimming, but anything that you can sustain for long periods of time um, at a low to moderate intensity without having to stop. Now this is should be the backbone of any preparation program but what most hikers tend to do is if they are following a training program is they might only just be doing this once a week and then on their weekend hiking they might sort of you know do a bit of strength training during the week they might just you know be relatively inactive and then the weekend they'll go for a long hike which is okay to an extent but if you really really want to develop this to your best of your ability you need to be um, stimulating this at least more than once a week so twice or three times ideally now obviously time commitments can play a factor here but you really really want to be aiming for this now the way you do this is just choosing some type of ex exercise as i said before which you can sustain for anywhere from 40 minutes plus now depending on your fitness that's going to depend on how long you go for and also your time commitments but it can be anywhere from say 40 minutes to three plus hours um, cyclists tend to be, you know, be out on the road for hours and hours and hours and hours. You know, for the everyday trekker, that might not be practical, but you just choose what's relevant here. Now, the main way to progress this, because I, as I always say, progression is the absolute key when it comes to um, training in any way, shape, or form, is you want to be progressing your aerobic capacity training by training volume and distance. So basically, instead of trying to go faster in workout by workout, you might just want to be increasing the distance and increasing the time a little bit each week. So if you are cycling, you might increase by 10, 15 minutes each week. If you're hiking, maybe an extra half an hour each week or whatever you can fit in. And just doing a slow and steady progression, going more and more and more and more, really, really does make a big difference in this type of training. Now, when I say that this is so incredibly important it is not just coming from my experiences even though you know the way that this type of training has been applied to my clients has been very successful but it's also coming from people who are much smarter and much more experienced than me in the high attitude performance world so the guys at high i'm um, uphill athlete they've been doing this stuff for years and years and years and they're more or less the world leaders when it comes to this type of stuff and they are firm believers that aerobic capacity really does make a massive difference to your chances of acclimatization up on the mountain the greater the aerobic capacity the less strain you can put on yourself during day by day by day when you're actually up on the mountain the more likely um the more energy your body's going to have to help your acclimatization and the more likely that's going to go ahead so number one aerobic capacity is so so important now number two as we said before we're trying to avoid fatigue um, and avoid exhaustion that's the key thing and usually high altitude hiking comes with an element of going uphill and elevation which we all know can very much tire us pretty quickly so we want to be making sure we're including a reasonable amount of elevation training in our workouts just to get us ready so that's not unnecessarily fatiguing us it's not unnecessarily exhausting us and putting us in a bad position so i spoke about this in length last week so i'm not going to dive into in too much details but in very very brief number one you need to be getting your legs strong and as strong as you can because it's going to make a massive difference to every single step you take when you're going up on elevation so that basically involves a reasonable amount of strength training which has got to getting down to some more difficult and heavier load strength training if appropriate for you and your personal situation that really really will pay off and then also muscular endurance training so teaching the body to be able to sustain um, repeated contractions again and again and again and again without fatiguing. So that's going to be developed through higher repetition strength training but just before you go, maybe things like loaded hill intervals, maybe stair climbing, stuff like that. Um, as we said, if you're living in, at sea level, you might not have access to um, regular mountains to climb on or big hills to climb on. So this is where you get creative and you might be climbing in an apartment block 
um, going up and down the fire escape. You might be in the gym using the Stairmaster. You might be just finding a relatively steep hill, which takes a few minutes to walk up and you just repeat, repeat, repeat. Whatever you need to do to stimulate that muscular endurance is going to be very, very effective here. Um, The next one I want to talk about is training your breathing. So I'm a firm believer in using diaphragmic breathing to help out at attitude. Now, to be entirely clear here, this is completely anecdotal, meaning this has worked for my clients in a number of situations. But as far as I'm aware, there's no real science or research to back this up. But when you look at it, it does make relative sense and it has worked for my clients. So I do like to recommend it. And on top of that, it has no downside to do it. It's not going to put you in trouble. It's not going to you know, be any issues. It's just you know, lots of upside potentially, and I really do like it. So diaphragmic breathing is very, very simple. Basically, when you're breathing in, you're trying to breathe in through your now- mouth, and as you take in the air, you're trying to feel your belly expand as opposed to the chest and the shoulders. The idea behind this is when you're breathing into the chest and the shoulders, as we naturally do when we're a little bit tired or we're a little bit stressed out, it stimulates your flight or fight response, which is basically you getting pumped up, ready to roll, trying to deal with a threat. Um, That can have a whole bunch of different changes in the body, but one thing is it, well, um, potentially that it does, is it doesn't let you utilize the oxygen you're taking in quite as effectively, or at least that's what they say. Alternatively, if you're doing diaphragmic breathing, then you're, what you're doing is stimulating your rest and digest response, which sort of calms the body down, lets it focus on a few different functions. And the main thing for us is it helps you utilize the oxygen you're taking in a little bit more effectively, or so you, um, so people say. What I've noticed with my clients is when they've done this, um, when it's up in the mountain and when it's that altitude is if they are getting a little bit spacey or a little bit tired by focusing on this, it can really root and remove some of the dizziness, some of the spaciness and get them feeling a little bit more comfortable. And when people can do this throughout the day, when they're going up hills and that, it just keeps their breathing a little bit more under control. So this is a really, really easy skill to practice at home when you are living at sea level, which can have some pretty decent and benefits when you're up on the mountain. And as with everything, the more you practice this and the more you train it, the more effective it's going to be, particularly in times of stress when you're up on the mountain, maybe potentially struggling for, struggling for breath or you know a little bit tired or whatever. So there's a little um, progression which I ask my clients to go through, which I do find can be quite effective to getting this going. So st- stage number one to learn this is simply lying on your back. So you might be doing this when you're lying in bed. Um, you know, you might be doing it before you go to sleep, or you might be doing this in your rest periods in the gym. You basically lie on your back, you put your hands across your belly, big, big breaths in through your nose, trying to feel your hands come up and through the belly as the belly expands, and then you breathe out and feel the belly come back to normal. And you literally spend, you know, if you're in bed, maybe five minutes in that. Um, doing that, you'll probably fall asleep more than likely. Um, or if you're in the gym, you might just do your rest periods there. And so it might be a minute or two or something like that. And you just practice it for a few weeks, just again and again and again, eventually gets easier. The next step is to do it when you're standing. So it's a little bit harder when you're actually on your feet. So you'll do this, you know, at home, if you're st- waiting for a bus, if you're in an elevator, if you are again in your rest periods in the gym, and you'll just stand, put your hands across your belly, feel that belly expand each time and away you go. Stage number three is when you're walking. So it does get significantly harder when you're actually walking. So this will be, you know, if you're just walking around the neighborhood, if you're walking to work, if you're walking around the office or even on your training hikes where you just want to focus breathing through the nose, feel that belly expand and roll through with that. The next one is when you're walking with a pack on. So this would be when you're actually on out hiking or if you're doing, you know, pack work in the gym, just having a weight on your back and a bit of a load on your back does make this a lot more difficult. So it is very, very important that you practice this before you hit the mountain, just so you can know you can deal with it with something on your back. And again, you'd be doing the same thing. So if you were doing your workout or your hike, you're just trying to maintain this more or less the entire time. And then finally, you'd be doing this in your rest periods in your interval training. Now, if you're doing any type of interval training um, in your rest periods, you tend to just, you know, faff around, not really do too much. This is really, really good to try and practice when you are quite huffed and puffed. Um, It's really, really difficult to do if you've just done a sprint or if you've just done something that's a bit higher intensity. But the more you can practice this, the easier it's going to be when you are on the mountain in that thin air and it's a little bit more difficult. So that's a little progression I get my um, my clients to go through. I feel like it's um, fine that it's relatively effective and can be very, very, um, very, very handy tool to use when you're up at attitude. Now, they're the three main things that I usually recommend. Aerobic capacity development, absolutely number one. Elevation training, making sure you're nailing that, and diaphragmic breathing when you're train, training for out, 
um, high altitude when you're at sea level. Now, you might be wondering if there was a few areas which I didn't cover, which you often hear recommended. So very briefly, I'll talk about three areas which you hear all the time, which I don't genuinely recommend. I have previously talked about these in other podcasts separately, but we'll talk about them now. Um, number one is hit or high intensity interval training. This is the most common thing I hear for high altitude in the sense that people will say, hey, the best way to train to get yourself um, in a high high attitude is to do high interval training because you get huffed and puffed on the mountain therefore if you're getting huffed and puffed um, in your training you're going to be training your lungs and you're going to be training your vo2 max and get you more comfortable in that situation and there is a grain of truth in there but it really really it's just not the best way of going about things when you are hiking in any way shape or form you're going to be predominantly using your aerobic energy system which is a very specific energy system which is used for lower intensity exercise alternatively when you're doing hit you're developing the anaerobic energy systems which are you know, energy systems which produce energy when you're doing high intensity exercise there is some crossover there but it's not as much as you would think and you're much better using your time to spend this on aerobic capacity training or longer um, moderate intensity stuff as opposed to this really really short sharp sprint training or hit classes or sprints and stuff like that people love doing it and it does make you feel good and it does have some particular benefits for trekkers but as focusing on it and thinking it's going to really really help you up at attitude is probably not the best way to go on about things so i don't generally recommend hit for this specific purpose number two is simulated attitude training now simulated attitude training is becoming more and more available to the everyday person and that's either involved you going into a, um, a chamber and you're doing some training in a simulated attitude chamber alternatively you're hiring a tent and you're sleeping in that now the main issue with this type of training is that the Simulated attitude training creates an artificial attitude environment, which is not exactly the same as natural attitude, has some similarities, but it also has some big differences. So therefore, a lot of the things that people claim for this type of training and this type of environment, they take from studies which have been done at natural attitude, and it just doesn't cross over with the two. Now, I've done an entire podcast on this previously, so I'm not going to dive into it too much, but I'm just going to say this type of stuff can have some benefits for you when you're going up at attitude but it's not that magic pill which a lot of people think it is um, main things if you're looking at this type of training number one it's going you've got to spend a lot of time doing it so i think um yeah if you're just going in you know a couple of times a week for 30 40 minutes in a chamber it's not going to do much or if you're just trying to sleep in a tent for a week or two it's not going to do much the people who are using the using it effectively to help them feel more comfortable at moderate attitudes and also to help apparently speed their acclimatization which there's a lot of debate around that and um, they're spending weeks and weeks and weeks sleeping every single night in a tent so that is the way you're going to get adaptations if you're not spending that much time i probably would recommend against it and then number three is elevation masks i talked about this the other week those big black masks that people wear in the gym um I'll just say they are a waste of your time. They don't do anything to mimic the effects of high attitude, although they often get marketed as something that will help you up on, you know, in thin air. It'll make it really difficult to breathe, but it won't do a thing to help you. So save your money, save your dignity there. Don't use them. They're a waste of your time. <laughs> I won't say too much more about that. So that's probably enough from me today, guys. Just to recap, if you are preparing for a high attitude hike and you live at sea level, we have no chance of doing um, acclimatization, whether we're going up to natural attitude or doing a training hike or something like that, you need to nail your aerobic capacity training as much as you can. You need to make sure you're doing everything you can do to um, avoid fatigue when you're doing your elevations and making sure that's nailed. Um, I highly recommend you practice and master that diaphragmic breathing and then nail those three things. You know, do all the good things you need to do at attitude, take your time, protect your sleep, stay hydrated, make sure you're eating plenty and then hopefully you're going to be in a really good position to get through your high attitude hike and have a really amazing adventure so i hope you've enjoyed the information today guys if you have taken some value out of this and you does has given you some new information to think about i really would appreciate if you can leave me a five-star review on itunes as i always say it makes a massive difference to helping me grow this podcast and i really would appreciate and absolutely genuinely love if you could take five seconds out of your time to go do that for me so again i hope you've enjoyed this episode today guys and we'll talk to you soon bye